Hello, Tudor. Um, thank you, Tudor. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for attending my talk. Yeah, so we're going to speak about uh, last level cache attacks in this talk. Um, but first of all, let me thank Xiao Fei Wu from Intel, who was a big um, collaborator of, this, of these slides as well. So yeah, last level cache attacks. Where are last level cache attacks, right? Well, for me, it's like the kind of approach that an attacker would take to enter a room that is protected by this lock. So he has two, two options here. He can either try every single possible key and try to get in the room, or he can, get, he can take a smarter choice, for example, by trying to guess the fingerprints in the lock and then trying to guess the code from there, right? So that's kind of what cache attacks do. What cache attacks do, well, cache attacks would be, in, or cache traces would be the, the fingerprints that we see in the lock. And the lock would be, for example, a software, a code that uh, implements some security solution. So when I tell my colleagues that I do this, right, that I take cache traces to recover cryptographic keys, for example, that wouldn't be able to, to, to be recovered uh, mathematically, at least. Um, so I get usually this answer, right? You must, you must be kidding, right? This cannot be possible. Well, thanks, thanks to the news that are echoing our results, I can answer them like this, right? I can actually point them out to these news that are actually echoing our results. And the reason why, why they're echoing our results now is because they're becoming more and more practical, right? And that's, that's the main thing. But not, not, the, not only that, but also software or commercial software is updating the security features um, in response to these kind of attacks. But it hasn't been always like this, so there was a time when cache attacks were a little bit disregarded, so cache attacks, exists since 10 years ago, roughly, uh, where when two, these two beautiful attacks uh, were actually implemented against AES and RSA. Um, but as I said, they were disregarded mainly because we don't have the scenarios that we have nowadays to apply cache attacks, and second, because they were applied in core private resources, so basically reducing the applicability of those attacks. However, it was in, it was in 2013 when we started seeing uh, cross-core attacks in the name of flash and reload, which we will see later what it, what it consists on. Um, but it, this one requires the duplication, right? Memory duplication. So this requirement was later relaxed, and now we have seen recently attacks on um, across CPU sockets, right? In AMD, for example, and also attacks in mobile devices. So hopefully we see the trend um, that in the last three years we've seen many, many, many work uh, doing, you know, improving the practicality of these attacks. And I expect this work to be even improved. So let's take a look at how they work, right? And the first thing is to define what a cache is. I, I keep saying cache, but I didn't say what it is. It's basically a, a, a small memory that you put it between the processor and the, and, the, and the main memory that it holds recently access data and that basically you can access faster. Instead of going to the memory all the time, you go to the cache and retrieve the, the data that you have accessed faster. Now, you can think that, well, an attacker might think about using this to guess um, I would create a contention to guess uh, what has been recently used, right? And that's true, but why would someone pick the last level cache? Well, I mentioned already one of the advantages. The fact that the last level cache is shared across cores make, makes it a, a huge target or a, a nice target because uh, otherwise we would have to target, for example, the level one cache and the branch prediction unit, which are core private resources. Um, but we have more advantages, including the high resolution that we see in the last level cache, also the inclusiveness one. The inclusiveness is a big one. Um, inclusiveness just means that any data that resides in the upper level caches has to also exist in the last level cache, and therefore, if we get to manipulate the last level cache, we're gonna get to manipulate um, the data in the upper level caches as well. We'll see how this is important. But, um, so now that we decided that we wanna attack the last level cache, let's see how the last level cache is actually organized. Um, and the way it is organized in modern, in modern CPUs is uh, as n-way set associative caches, meaning that the cache is gonna be divided into equal sized uh, n-way sets. And the, the set that our memory block is gonna occupy is gonna be um, determined by the physical address of the memory block. In particular, the physical address will be divided into th these three main fields, the cache tag, the set, and the byte. And the important one for us as attackers is uh, the set field basically because it will point to the set that this memory block will occupy. And we'll see later why this is important for us. So the first attack that I'm gonna explain here is the flash and reload attack, um, which requires shared memory between the attacker and the victim. And you might, you know, you might think, well, this isn't realistic. In the, the, the truth is, it's not. I mean, Linux implements kernel same page merging by default, meaning that uh, you will get to share some of the memory with, with other processes or users. And also, Android implements uh, similar, similar approaches. 
But let's see what these approaches do, right? So basically, imagine that you have the RAM like this in which you have uh, yeah, identical memory pages that are used by different processes users, right? So what these kind of mechanisms would do is just merge them all into one, such that all processes users um, access the, the, the same memory page. Now, these memory pages are read-only usually. However, they still pose a big, big threat, and, and actually one of them is the flash and reload attack, and that's why, as I said before, commercial software like VMware uh, updated, who was actually advertising this mechanism, updated the, the, the default security features to, to disable this. But let's get to the attack. So basically imagine that an attacker and a victim get to share some memory, for example, the red memory block that we see in the cache. The attacker, the first thing that he's going to do is he's going to flash the memory block from the cache, meaning that what he's going to do is utilize uh, specific instructions in the instruction set architecture that, that are going to allow us to kick, it, to kick the memory block out of the cache. Now, next, he's going to wait until the victim does or doesn't make an access to that memory block. If she does make an access, she will bring the memory block back to the cache. If not, she will not. And then after that happened, um, the attacker is going to re-access the memory block and is going to measure the time that it takes to re-access it. Now, two scenarios might arise here. If the, what we see in the, in the, in the graph is actually um, two histograms, uh, so we see in the x-axis hardware cycles, um, the blue histogram represents memory accesses, the red histogram represents cache accesses. So what, he will, that what the attacker will see is that when the victim used the memory block during his waiting period, um, he will see uh, timings below around 70 cycles. While when, he, when the victim didn't access the memory block, he will see kind of the blue histogram. So easily dis distinguishable. Um, now, we said that flash and reload only work when we have shared memory between the victim and attacker. What happens when we don't? That's where the second attack that I'm going to explain today, the prime and prof attack, comes in, right? So prime and prof doesn't, doesn't assume any, any special, or doesn't assume any, speci any specific characteristic but just takes a different approach. So imagine the attacker uh, chooses one set in the cache, and he decides to prime it. Basically, he will fill the set with his own junk data. All right? Now, again, as before, he's going to wait until the victim does or doesn't make an access. If she does make an access, she will have to replace one of the memory blocks that we filled uh, in the set right, with, with her own memory block. Now, what the attacker is going to do again, he's going to reaccess the, the memory blocks that he filled before, right? So basically, in this case, what he will see is that um, 11 of them come from the cache and one comes from memory, meaning that someone has utilized the set that, that we're priming. If not, um, we will see um, that all of them come from the cache. Now, you might be wondering, how, how the hell can I, can I use this to, to perform an attack, right? So what we see in the, in the slide is a code that uh, actually belongs to a, to a commercial library. So I've seen this code implemented. It's a modular exponentiation that does uh, an RSA, well, it does an RSA exponentiation, right? So with, with a secret key that it's uh, the E that we see there that processes the secret key bit by bit. If the bit is a zero, um, we execute different branches, right? So we, ex we, execute, we execute different instructions. Now, what we can do with this code is, for example, get the, this instruction's uh, address and implement the flash and reload attack. How do we do it, right? So imagine that instruction, for some reason, is in the cache at the beginning. Once again, the attacker is going to flash that instruction from the cache. Remember, the attacker has, the attacker has access to this instruction because it's shared with the victim. Um, now he's going to let the victim um, perform one iteration of the loop. And the victim has to process a zero or a one. If she processes a, a zero, she will have to bring the instruction back to the cache because she utilizes it. If not, she will not put it in the cache. Now, again, the attacker performs the reload step, and if he sees that the block is in the cache, he will actually assume that the victim or was processing a zero bit. How does prime and probe work, right? A little bit different, so we have to map, first of all, the address of the instruction to a set. And once we map that instruction to a set, we can actually prime the, the set, right? So basically, we fill it with our own junk data again. And we let the victim execute one iteration of the loop again. If the victim utilizes, or she, if she's processing a zero bit, she will have to utilize the instruction that we are targeting, and she will basically have to utilize the set that we're priming, meaning that she will have to replace one, one of our memory blocks. Now again, the attacker comes in again, measures uh, the reload time of, of his own memory blocks, and what he will see is that one of them comes from memory, and therefore he will guess that the victim uh, 
process the serial instead of a one. So in this way, both attacks can actually uh, be utilized to re um, recover a full RSA key. So great, um, but these are kind of sophisticated attacks. Where can they be applied, right? Maybe they cannot be applied everywhere, right? So let's just start by giving examples of things that uh, we commonly use, right? For example, commercial infrastructure as a service or product as a service clouds, right? And where, why are cache attacks applicable here? Well, mainly because um, we get to share the underlying hardware easily with someone that, that we can identify as a target, right? So, um, and this hardware isolation is usually not provided in, in commercial uh, in commercial clouds, right? So basically, we can get targets easily, and an example of this kind of attack is the RSA key that we retrieved in Amazon EC2 in one year ago. So I, you have the paper in the, in the bottom of the slide. And let's see some pros of this scenario, right? So what do we get by attacking, by performing cache attacks in this scenario? So we get access, first of all, we can choose the, the operating system in which we wanna carry out the attack, so that's, that's actually a, a big one. And therefore, we get access to high grain, fine grain timers, timers or, huge, or, or huge pages, which can actually speed up the attack. Also, if the cloud is somehow doing some memory saving um, approach, right, he might, uh, they might have the duplication enabled, and therefore, therefore both attacks are applicable. And this is important because flash and reload behaves better than prime and prof in some, in some scenarios. Now, um, the cons. Um, Sometimes coherency with the target can be hard just to achieve, maybe even impossible if the target, if we have a target in mind that is uh, being, um, well, that is executing in, a, in an isolated machine. And also we, ha we get high amount of noise, right? The workloads, workloads that we see in the, in the cloud are actually quite heavy compared to other scenarios and therefore we will get a lot of noise in our measurements. More scenarios, we can execute uh, cache attacks as malicious JavaScript executions. So basically, we can insert the JavaScript code that contains a cache attack in a website um, that will be accessed by, by, by a victim's browser, right? And therefore, this JavaScript code will be executed by the, by the victim's browser in the victim's local machine, right? Um, an example, again, is the incognito browser, browsing profiling that Oren et al. performed uh, two years ago. And some pros um, of this scenario, we don't need to find a correcting target as before, right? Because, uh, well, the target will come to us by accessing the website. And then the attack can be executed in the local machine, meaning that usually, again, the workloads that we see in a local machine are, are, are less than or are um, not as heavy as the ones that we see in the club. Some cons of these scenarios. Um, well, one of the attacks is not applicable. Why? Because we need access to a specific um, very low level instructions, right, in instruction set architecture, which might not be possible to do from, from, from JavaScript, which is a high level language. And second, um, fine grained timer, timers are, hard to, are becoming hard to achieve. So in response, uh, browse, browsers are actually eliminating uh, fine grained timers, and therefore these attacks are becoming more difficult to, to execute. More, trust execution environments, very popular with the release of Intel SGX and the wide adoption of, of trust zone, right? So, um, these environments actually are supposed to isolate uh, the trust, trusted and untrusted worlds, right? So basically, there is a trusted world in, in which you can execute processes securely. However, um, even if you know you have mechanisms like DRAM encryption and so on, uh, the truth is that both worlds utilize the same last level cache, and therefore, and actually, in a non-encrypted way. So this means that we can still apply the attacks that we have seen before. Uh, an example, again, is the trust on AES key still that uh, Billy Bob Bramley did. And some pros, uh, I think the best advantage of this scenario is that we get access, so we can assume that the operating system is untrusted, meaning that we can actually um, get access to fine-grained resources like scheduling. We can even put processes uh, the way we want in the, in, in the same core, for example, et cetera. And also, we don't need to find a corset and target again, but the trusted execution environment is gonna be our target. And then some cons, um, flash and reload is not applicable because uh, usually uh, memory pages are not um, deduplicated between trusted and untrusted worlds. And the last one that I wanna speak about today is as malicious smartphone applications. As I said before that cache attacks um, have been demonstrated to be applicable in ARM devices or in, in mobile devices as well, so why not put them into a, into, an, into a smartphone application, right? Something that we use every day. So basically, these smartphone applications are gonna be executed in a Dolby VM and so on, but they are gonna, again, utilize the same hardware caches, right? So uh, you can still apply the, the, the attacks that we see. 
Um, again, this has been demonstrated to be possible with the AES key still across applications. And then some uh, advantages. Um, the duplication is generally, I mean, we are speaking about low RAM devices here, right? So that means that we need to save as much memory as possible. So the duplication is usually, uh, is usually uh, uh, utilized in these kind of devices. Um, and second, in my opinion, it has an easy deployment in the sense that we can reach a lot of people by just trying to embed the cache attack into an apparently benign um, application. And these cache attacks, since they, since they just consist on memory access and, and, and some, um, yeah, some weird memory accesses, they are difficult to detect uh, whether they are in an in a apparently benign code or not. And some cons, so uh, mobile devices are very, um, you know, an attack that might work in a mobile device, it might not work in the other one. Why? Because these devices are very, uh, you know, they have, the, have very different characteristics in the sense of some of them are, have a non-inclusive cache and most, some of them have pseudo-random replacement policies, et cetera. So different characteristics in the, even in the same um, mobile family. So now let's get to how can we mitigate these attacks, right? Um, and for me, the most important, um, you know, countermeasure that we should apply is we should start implementing, implementing code at least uh, you know, security critical code, right, uh, in a, with, without cache leakage, right? So that in, in a way that we know it's not going to leak in, in information in the cache, right? How do we achieve it? Um, so basically the, the function that you see or the code snippet that you see in the, in the slide is the same one. It implements the same um, mechanism as the one that we saw before that was leaking information. Um, but this time it doesn't. Why? Because we have secret independent execution flow to begin with. So we have this for loop that regardless of the key bit being processed, is going to execute the same instructions. Second, we have secret independent memory accesses. So what we are doing is actually whenever we need a register, we're accessing both registers. Again, um, and we're masking it with the key. So this means that we are going to bring both registers, both values to the cache, and therefore the attacker will not be able to know whether we are processing a zero or a one bit. So these kind of uh, two goals that in the software development, I think they have to be uh, acquired by, by software designers. Um, so more approaches that we can take uh, at a different level, for example, at the operating system level, uh, we can actually uh, perform page coloring. What is page coloring? Um, we can actually color the DRAM pages in such a way that each user is going to get one of the colors, and that means that um, each user will have a portion of the cache. So they will not collide in the cache. And of course, if there are no collisions in the cache, we cannot execute the attacks that we have, we have been speaking. And second, we can use the Intel CAD technology, for example, uh, recently released that what it does is basically it allows you to lock certain ways in the cache. Lock means uh, I'm going to put a lock there, and yeah, we'll, we will not be able as attackers to evict that memory block from the cache. And if, again, if we, if we think again out the attacks, if we, don't, if we are not able to evict the victim's memory block, we don't gain anything. We don't gain any information. <laughs> so before concluding, I would like, you, um, I would like to give some key takeaways. Uh, the first one, in case you didn't notice, cache attacks are already practical. I can bold it. Um, but I don't know what else we need because we have seen them in th in applied in technologies that we use every day. We're browsing the smartphones, even in uh, clouds, right? So what else do we need? I, don't, I, I already believe that cache attacks are practical, but if there's someone that doesn't believe it, it will probably, you know, if someone, else, if someone needs a some more scenarios to, to believe this, it will come probably in the next years because many researchers are putting effort on um, showing that these are practical. So a call to action, let's start protecting against this, right? Let's start you know, acquiring habits of uh, cache leakage-free code design, and in general, side channel, side channel leakage-free code design. Because this is important, we're building security tools, right? And therefore, we have to ensure that they don't leak information. And second, we should start implementing, I mean, we have the solutions there. Solutions exist for operating systems hyper, or hi, and hypervisors. Even we now have a hardware framework that we can use it. So let's start using them to stop these kind of attacks before it's too late. Um, thank you. And that will conclude my presentation. And I will be happy to answer questions.